Recently we've seen that pure substances can exist in various states of matter and looked at the structures of these in the solid state. But of course it's relatively rare for matter to exist in the pure form and so it's important to be able to understand and predict how these can be mixed. Solubility is the extent to which one substance, which we'll call the solute, uh, can be mixed with or dissolved in another substance, which we'll call the solvent, to form a homogeneous mixture, uh, in other words a solution. Now there are many, many different types of examples of this. We can dissolve up uh, one gas in another, an example being air, is a mixture of gases. We tend to call these mixtures rather than solutions. Uh, another example is, is dissolving up gases in liquids, for example carbonated water. Uh, we can dissolve one liquid into another, for example ethanol in water. Rather than talk about solubility here, we tend to talk about the miscibility uh, of those, those liquids uh, being dissolved. Perhaps most familiar is the idea of dissolving a solid in a liquid, for example ionic solids like salt in water, um, and of course we can also dissolve up neutral species uh, like sugar. Now it's not just liquids and indeed gases that can act as solvents, uh, we can also in special circumstances have solids acting as solvents, uh, for example dissolving up gas, gases like hydrogen gas into metals to form metal hydrides, uh, we can have liquids dissolving in solids, for example water into polymer electrolytes, and uh, even we can have solids dissolving in solids, and you can think of many metal alloys as actually being uh, solid solutions. Now our principal focus here will be on the dissolution of ionic compounds into water, uh, as this is really fundamental to aqueous chemistry. Um, additionally, like acid-base chemistry, it's going to provide us with a really good platform to apply what we know about equilibrium theory. Now it's important, firstly, to be able to identify the ions that form when we dissolve an ionic solid in water to form an aqueous solution. Uh, having a look at a list of common cations on the right hand side, we can see some familiar ones like hydronium and ammonium. Uh, we then have a long list of different types of metal ions. Uh, the alkali metals such as lithium, sodium, potassium have a 1 plus charge. The alkali earth metals, magnesium, calcium, strontium, barium have a 2 plus charge. Uh, there's a few p-block metals such as aluminium, tin and lead. Uh, we then have a long list of different d-block metals, uh, or the transition elements, uh, which can commonly have uh, multiple oxidation states. Now when we dissolve ions in solution, uh, this process is actually stabilised by the fact that uh, the, the water molecule has a strong dipole, and so we will see uh, ion dipole forces uh, between those ions in solution. Here we see a sodium ion uh, with the negative lobes of the water molecule pointing towards that, that uh, positively charged ion, stabilising its positive charge. Having a look at uh, a list of common anions, we can see some familiar ones up the top being the halides with a 1 minus charge, fluoride, chloride, bromide and iodide. Uh, we then have quite a, a diverse range of other types of anions, many of which are oxo anions. And uh, I should mention that some of these actually don't exist in water, uh, like oxide and sulfide, because uh, they're extremely strong bases and they'll protonate um, to form their conjugate acids. Uh, amongst these we have common species like, uh, like sulfate, and uh, carbonate, nitrate, phosphate and so on. Uh, you can also have some organic derivatives of these such as sulfonates, phosphonates. Uh, an example of uh, an organic deriv derivative of carbonate is, uh, is acetate which has a, a methyl group uh, on there. Uh, we also have some other examples in there like cyanide, thiocyanate uh, and we also have some oxoanions of transition metals like uh, chromate, dichromate and permanganate. Now one reason it's important to uh, be able to remember some of these anions is that when you see a dissolution reaction such as this one here, uh, it's important to be able to work out what species are going to form uh, upon dissolution. So for example the, the compound NH4NCS uh, consists of two discrete species, the ammonium cation uh, and the thiocyanate anion. Okay, so how do we define solubility? Well, it's the concentration achieved when dissolution reactions reach equilibrium and when this happens we have a saturated solution. Uh, an example might be dissolving uh, or bubbling oxygen gas through water or dissolving an excess of sodium chloride uh, in water. Now there are many different units that we could choose to use to define uh, solubility and because we're going to be looking at this in terms of chemical equilibrium it's very important that we choose units that correspond to the standard state. Now for a gas the standard state has as, as a pure gas at one atmosphere of pressure and so we're going to use atmospheres as, a, as our units in, in pressure. And in solution, uh, the standard state is a solution with one mole per litre concentration. So it's, it's the moles per litre are the units that we're going to be using. If we write out the equilibrium constant expression for dissolving oxygen gas in water, then it's the concentration of dissolved oxygen divided by the partial pressure of oxygen gas. 
if we were to double the constant, the partial pressure of oxygen gas, then we're going to double the amount of, of dissolved oxygen. Now this has a name, it's, it's called Henry's Law, where the equilibrium constant is KH, which is the Henry's Law constant. For dissolving an ionic solid, such as salt in water, uh, we multiply together the concentration of the uh, ions in solution. Notice, of course, we don't divide through by sodium chloride, because that's as a solid, that's in the standard state. And this gives us our equilibrium constant Ksp, otherwise known as the solubility product. OK, so what influences whether one substance is going to be soluble in another? Well, we've seen previously that uh, the Gibbs free energy change, which is delta G, uh, can be related to the equilibrium constant K through this expression here. Uh, delta G is minus the, the gas constant times the temperature times the natural log of the equilibrium constant. And this delta G term uh, is, is comprises of two components, the, the change in enthalpy of the system and minus te the temperature in Kelvin times the change in the entropy uh, of that system. If we re rearrange that first expression, you get uh, an expression that gives you the equilibrium constant in terms of delta G. We have E to the minus delta G divided by the gas constant times temperature. And if we break this up into its two components, we can see that the equilibrium constant K depends firstly on uh, the enthalpy, for example, the enthalpy change. For example, if we have an exothermic process with a large negative delta H, that's going to favor having a, a large uh, value for K or something that's going to be very soluble. Similarly, if we have a large value, uh, positive value of delta S, so we have a system that, that goes to, uh, has an increase in entropy uh, upon dissolution, then that's also going to favor having a high uh, equilibrium constant. If we look at a fairly trivial example of this, uh, if we mix together gases, um, then uh, by opening this tap, you can see that uh, this process you, you, is, is not going to have a, a much of, a, of an enthalpy change, and that's because the interactions between the gas molecules are, are very weak. However, there is going to be an increase in entropy uh, when we open this tap because of the, uh, the mixing of those species. And it's this increasing en in entropy that makes this a spontaneous process and, and means that gases uh, readily mix. Now dissolving gases in liquids is actually a little bit more complicated. Generally we find for aqueous solutions that this is an exothermic process uh, and you're familiar already with, with the uh, idea that uh, dissolving carbon dioxide in water, to, in, in carbonated water or soft drinks, um, that this is, happens less readily at higher temperature uh, because this being exothermic means that this value decreases uh, at higher temperature and so gas solubility de decreases on warming. Generally gas solubilities are, are fairly low in, in solution and that's because entropically this is an unfavorable process. So for example nitrogen and oxygen gas are only really sparingly soluble in water um, and that's also because we have uh, only very weak interactions between the, the, the liquid and, and the gas, uh, dipole, uh, induced dipole and also uh, dispersion forces. If we have stronger forces such as hydrogen bonding then we can get thousands of times higher solubilities uh, which is what we see for ammonia and hydrogen fluoride. Uh, we can also get quite high solubilities when our gas molecules react with the water molecules. So for example hydrogen chloride gas uh, dissociates to form hydronium and chloride ions or hydrochloric acid and we can also have gases that react uh, such as carbon dioxide to form carbonic acid, sulfur dioxide forms sulfurous acid, sulfur trioxide forms sulfuric acid and nitrogen dioxide forms a mixture of nitrous and nitric acid. So in these cases we can get um, some, some greater solubilities because of these types of uh, reactions and interactions. If we look at solids in liquids, things are even more complicated again. And for aqueous solutions, we commonly find that this is now an endothermic process. And that's really because uh, we're having to overcome the lattice enthalpy. We're having to break all of these ionic bonds uh, to get these ions into solution. Now this is compensated to a very high degree by the fact that once in solution, we get these very favorable ion dipole interactions of those ions uh, surrounded by those water molecules. Uh, but generally this is, this is uh, endothermic, which, is, which means that um, if you put a, 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 a positive value in here, you can see that solubilities for solids in liquids in general will increase upon warming. Uh, there are some notable exceptions in water. For example, cerium sulfate uh, is actually less soluble at higher temperature um, due to that the dissolution being exothermic. Now again, we, uh, in contrast to gases, of course, we have uh, now a situation where this is entropically favoured because we're going from an ordered uh, solid lattice uh, towards uh, getting those ions into solution. 
Now if one or both of our ions in solution are able to act as acids or bases, then another thing that will influence the solubility is the pH. If we look at the substance that seashells are made from, calcium carbonate, in the gibbsite form, uh, then we can see the solubility product is a very small number. It's 4.6 by 10 to the minus 9. We tend to regard compounds like this as being insoluble, uh, but of course uh, a better expression might be that they're really only very sparingly soluble in water. Officially, of course, we can't actually have a K value of zero or something being completely insoluble because that would imply, according to delta G equals minus RT ln K, that we would need to have a, a, a plus infinity value for delta G uh, to get that value of zero. Now, once in solution, our carbonate anions uh, undergo hydrolysis. They act as a reasonably strong base. And uh, what we then see is that the ratio of hydrogen carbonate ions to carbonate ions is going to depend on the pH. So if we have a small value for the OH- concentration, then that will give us a, a, a high ratio of, of hydrogen carbonate to carbonate ions, according to our, our base ionization constant expression. So at low pHs, we're going to see that this reaction is going to be pushed towards the right-hand side with protonation of our carbonate ions. And in using up these carbonate ions uh, by protonation, or by depleting them, uh, then we're going to have to get increased so, uh, solubility of our calcium carbonate in order to maintain our value for, for Ksp. And indeed, this is a, a very important reaction or pair of reactions, and it's what we're seeing in the oceans at the moment with increasing acidities uh, due to carbon dioxide dissolution, is that uh, with increasing solubility of, of calcium carbonate at lower pHs, uh, it's becoming progressively more difficult for things like plankton to form their exoskeletons out, out of gibbsite. If we have a quick look at one of the types of calculations that we're going to be performing, uh, let's take the example of barium hydroxide, which has a KSP value of 5.0 by 10 to the minus 3 at 25 degrees Celsius. Uh, notice we have to specify the temperature because that uh, varies, this value varies uh, with temperature. Uh, upon dissolution, we will get uh, barium ions, and we'll get two hydroxide ions for every one barium ion in solution, according to the stoichiometry of our ionic compound. Uh, so at equilibrium, we'll have x amounts of barium, two x amounts of uh, hydroxide, and uh, substituting this into the KSP expression, which looks like this. Notice, of course, that we have this as two, that we square the concentration of OH minus. Uh, so this two actually appears twice. We get two x uh, to the power two, uh, which overall gives us 4x cubed, and solving that we find that the barium, barium concentration is 0.11 and the hydroxide ion concentration is double that.